So in a one line, simple line, uh, be honest, share your problem, interact with people, spare some time, discuss your fear is in first step to counter mental health issue. We all want to look normal and good. Human beings are not born to look normal and good all the time in all the situation. Sometimes you want to cry. Sometimes you are weak. Sometimes you are insolvent. Uh, what a T.S. Eliot said, don't get up in the morning. You make a face in order to beat the faces. Hello and welcome to Dinesh Guarda, Cities ABC Open Business Council YouTube podcast series. Once again, we are here with another fabulous interview and about uh, profiling some of the key personalities in the world. And as well, talking about what makes the, um, I would say, our times more exciting. And as well, learning from each other, from different experiences, from different as well ways of looking at uh, technology to life, to our cultures, and to the operating system that is what makes humanity. We've been profiling a lot of personalities in this, and each personality is a world in its own, both for their achievements, but as well for the capacity to inspire and create new solutions. And that's precisely the case of our special guest today, Kewal Kapoor, and that is joining us from India, and uh, is a very, uh, I would say, comprehensive multi-faceted personality, uh, almost a polyglot in a lot of ways. And I will just uh, highlight a bit of the different personality parts of him. So um, Kewal uh, Kapoor is quite well known as uh, both uh, executive producer and uh, writer and the strategist uh, in India, but as well with background international and the creative and the digital personality that has been actually doing some of the biggest crossover experiences in media for instance he was responsible for the campaign of incredible india that uh, especially the ones that live that actually visit india probably heard and it was a huge success in terms of creating a new visual visualization and as well way of looking at india but keval has a, a quite a strong background and i will just read some of the things so he's the founder and creator of a shy creative and advertisement agency and it's all concept that is about uh, um, looking at uh, doing different ways of looking at uh, research um, and ways of living and we're going to talk about that is a proficient writer investigator and journalist and of course like i mentioned a producer and director this uh, crossover industry experience has made him an exceptional strategist and consultant and has been working with governments and as well looking at the i think special the bridges between digital creative campaigns and uh, as well the strategy necessary for both television and different things previously um keval as well has been executive producer with utv where he's been researching and scripted conceptualizing uh, the first ever series on text laws in india uh, and he was as well uh, behind the project of the human rights show in indian television and after that he's been working um on different areas like uh, uh, the Cargill Martyrs research that he's been doing as a journalist. He was as well in different prominent indie dailies. And as a producer director, he's been involved in a lot of things in terms of TV documentaries and different accolades. Um, in terms of uh, his background, uh, he is on the advisory board of Podar Foundation and has played a key role on the mental health and mental health brand Silence Todo. And this company, Shai Creative and Advertisement, is duly recognized in terms of the government of India, and as well has been looking at new mandates for advisory, advertising, and marketing, including digital ecosystem of the larger affordable uh, housing companies in India. And as well, recently started a podcast that probably yes. is going to be speaking as well here. So that's much more achievements, and I think probably one of them I want to just highlight that. Um, uh, Keval has been synonyms of uh, extensive work and the multi-crossroad. 
but as well he, he conceived the first of its kind um, not-for-profit project trust that is on Mahatma Math Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, yes. Okay, so, okay, well, welcome to our series. I could go for a lot of my, a lot of more no, things. No, that's right. as well. Uh, so you have both an academic background as well that is quite interesting. But, well, let's start a bit about you, uh, where you're coming from, um, and as well, how did you reach where you are now? And I think probably I would like always to touch a bit of your childhood because I, I know that India went through multiple different decades in one decade. But in your case, probably saw the, the different parts of the evolution of India, but you as well were in the UK. So you have a bit of a different background and looking at things in a different way. Thank you for inviting me. And it's, it's always a pleasure to interact with you, get to learn a lot from your insight into a global perspective, Dennis. And I'm very honored to be here. And uh, so uh, talking about my childhood, what I'll do is that I quickly touch and move on rather than going into the detail. I was born in, in a small town in India, which is a central part of India. It's called Madhya Pradesh State. And I was born in a city like what is called Indore, which traditionally is considered to be the hub of Hindi journalism which is one of the prominent language, which is like about 63% of people in India speak that language. It has actually contributed a lot of uh, writers of a Hindi literature background and in Hindi journalism as well. So I did my schooling from there, but uh, that's, that's a bit of a struggle because I lost my mother when I was 11 years old only, and I was in a school. So we all shifted back to Delhi. And uh, that's a quite an interesting thing. Within a three years of my life, at the age of 14, I ran away from home and uh, did whatever I did till date on my own. So um, I completed my schooling. I did join the evening college and completed Commerce Graduate. I was an activist in Democratic Right Organization. Then as you read, uh, you know, as you said that, then I was involved in BBC's couple of projects. I have created, uh, what I wanted to mention is specifically that I created a lot of innovative project in this country. So first one was a human rights show, which was never ever done. Second was the tax of finance is considered to be an extremely difficult area and people don't understand it. So making a documentary show entirely of 13 part series, that too with the KPMG. So it was a first series of text laws done for the government of India. That was one of the things. Then I was involved in the biggest portal on a sports in India, which is Commonwealth Sports Portal. That is one of its time. I was also involved in one of the Encyclopedia of Gandhi, which was at that point of time released by the Prime Minister's office, London, India, both. And it in those days was trending on a Twitter, which we today talk about nonviolence and peace. So these are one of things that I did. And my college is like commerce graduate and, you know, I did a lot of things. So it's very difficult for me. I, I produced and directed short films, almost about 30 short films or short capsules or different kinds. Uh, one of the things which I'd like to mention is about the aging, which is elders, that's the area where I'm very passionately involved into also, is I have not approached that from the point of view of uh, not for profit, but in social impact business. Uh, we brought a change in the government of India policy, second life now recognized by and large by one and a half year of our effort into it. I did the largest production, Return of Million is mine, and as an exclusive partner till date with the government of India on aging. Oh, wow, the, that's quite impressive. So, so let's talk about, um, uh, I would like, I always like to go with the personal level. So from your background, like you mentioned, you lost your mother quite young and um, you went through all these kind of shifts in India. And India, of course, is becoming one of the biggest economies in the world. I think it's going to be the second economy by 2050, more or less, or probably even before. And it's, of course, 1.3 billion people. And uh, it has one of the most I would say most uh, heterogeneous civilizations ever because it has probably the number of languages, the number of uh, uh, cultures, religions, and so forth. So 
Can you tell us a bit about that background of yours? Because you, you've been on strategy and strategy is about culture and know how to deal with so, this. So, so a bit so, of your personal so, background with the background of India. Okay. Okay. So I, I was born and brought up in a small town, which now is one of the cleanest town under the clean drives of India. It's an indoor, a cultural hub, Hindi, but then been in. I lived in about almost six states, Delhi, Bombay, uh, Varanasi, Ujjain, and Gumla and Chaiba. So these are different parts of India, different states, you know. Now, if I talk about a multicultural audience, there is a saying in Hindi, ek kos per pani, do kos per bhasha. In every spoken languages, changes like within a hundred yards and a written language changes in 200 yards. That's how there is a popular saying in Hindi. Uh, interesting part of this is when the constitution was made, the state were recognized on the basis of linguistic identity. So, so the, 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 the language became that the state was, you know, created on. Uh, by and large, if I talk about Hindi is the largest speaking language in the country, about 63% people speak, read and write Hindi. And then there are Telugu, Malayalam, Kannada, Odisha, Odia, Bhojpuri, Maithila, all languages are there. One thing which, which is my cultural experience of living and interacting with people is it's, a, it's not only a diverse nation, it is an extremely innovative nation if, if this culture is given a right tools, you know. Let's take, for example, like it's difficult to get an artificial intelligence book in Hindi or in regional languages. The modern technologies, if it has to expand far more and see more innovation in India, it should do, it should be more in regional languages. Now, uh, the, the one more thing which I want to add here, is the digital is recognizing this uh, change, you know. I remember when a cricket, which is a religion in the country, was at Star, Star TV. The moment it started broadcasting it in regional languages, which is a hot star, its audience uh, went up by 32% almost. Hot star make large amount of money. Now there is a shift to make a content in regional languages, which is it includes Hindi and other regional languages. So culturally, it's a diverse nation. It, it thinks differently, it acts differently, it eats and, and sleep in a very different manner. It's, it's a festival even are different. So those local nuances has to be kept in mind all the time, I feel. No, and I think that's what makes a country uh, thrive and as well create new ways and balance as well which is not easy nowadays because of all the the challenges that we are facing so you've Gee. been so let's see how did you get into writing into digital into agencies first and now as well through this i would like to touch about that part because you are as well one of the most influential people in digital and as well uh, in writing and and uh, in media uh, in India and as well, your network is really close to nothing, but as well is the passion that you put on things like you just mentioned. I got into writing because of two specific reasons. I lost my mother at a very young age and I was a runaway child. The only thing for me was the book was my solace. It was not, it was, it was very difficult for me to buy books, you know, and, and, and the internet was not there, you know, at, it's, it's Google didn't came to India at that point of time. So I used to go in a library and, you know, read my, I, I read a lot, actually, and that's from where the writing came. I started writing poetry in college, and I remember, you know, I was writing poetry because I could go and read those poetry in inter-university competitions so I can get a cash prize. Uh, that was my income, actually. That's how I began writing. You know, it was, I was funding my education with debate competition, poetry competition, and essay writing. Now that has become a habit. What started as a profession to support my education became my passion actually. And uh, there was a one very great lady in a literature in Hindus. Mother was also a big person. 
Mrinal Pandey, who was heading a daily newspaper, which was called Dainik Hindustan, offered me to write in a paper. And that's how my journey began in writing, you know. And a writing from that day till now is something that I have been doing. And I do write in about 17 dailies. Now I write more on aging and branding, but uh, I have written a lot of television scripts, uh, shows, documentaries and research also. So the writing is close to my heart in sense. I feel it gave me a company that I was looking forward to. The book was still, book is still a part of my life. That's where I found most of the answer through the book. And, and when I connected to the people, um, I felt that, you know, there is a bridge between the people and the book because I was well read. It was very easy for me to connect to that. So the writing is, uh, I shared that with you, writing for me is a healing process and as well a, a yes. passion. And, and, the, and then when it comes to strategy, because of course you've been building a lot of agencies and working. So can you tell us a bit about that process of the agency work? Because I know that is, first of all, the, the Indian economy is massive, but so, I think... Yeah. So, so a strategy part is, this is started like this. I was executive producer with UTV and I left my job and we started a company called Televista Vision where I visited Kashmir in one and a half year, about eight times, and I made a short documentary and we did work for Ministry of External Affairs. And then one fine day advertising agency, uh, because I was good with the government, they, 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 are, they were known at that time as a Lintas. Now they are known as low Lintas because Lintas is bought over by IPG. It is one of the largest agency in the country. They wanted to do something in the government sector and they were not doing anything substantial. So uh, I strategized the complete offer of the government for them, which was in Incredible India, that how the government should be approached, what is a target audience of the government is, how government communication is different. You know, the way you write a letter to the corporate and the way you write a letter to the bureaucrat is totally different. It's the communication itself is a different. And the government also likes you to communicate in certain manner with a lot of if and but. It's a very tight rope walking. Everything has to go through the process and all that. Then they, they have nothing called a creative brief in the beginning, but they do have a policy framework which says that they have to achieve this target. Okay. So for a government, the strategy was primarily to understand each one of them is different. So the solution, you know, this is not a pilot project kind of a situation when you work with the government, that how you concur the Ministry of Tourism, you can't use the same method and go and concur the other ministry. The requirement is different. The targets are different strategy is different and in those days it was limited to print and television media we did our international media campaign also of online for ministry of tourism which was one of the largest in those point of time in india now the digital has become huge so when it comes to a strategy for the government a government actually primarily look at the content very specifically in terms of language in terms of you don't have much liberty to do with visuals, but now they are more open to it. A dissemination, it has its own choice, manner and method through which it wants to pass on its information. It doesn't uh, uses all the tools which disseminate, you know, hey, go ahead and use Twitter, social media, everything, but it decides which one it wants to use, which is a part of a media planning. So that's what I feel. A digital strategy of the government is primarily different. I think this is going to be more and more important going forward. So, so and in terms of, uh, so your views in terms of, uh, so you, you have quite a substantial work, like you said, with non-for-profits and trust and as well creating a lot of education projects. Can you tell us about some of the highlights and some of the things you want to share with us? On that level about the ngo part not for profit yeah the, the work you've been doing on ngos and the work on that in particular i i i've been actually from the college days i i said i was an activist so i was a part of a democratic right organization which primarily was looking at uh, various offenses or or violations which happens 
uh, we investigated uh, prison conditions we have investigated cases of custodial death and custodial violence extrajudicial killing and murders and all that was a serious side of activism uh, but uh, as later on uh, then uh, uh, the i as i said earlier also then i was involved with buddhar foundation in sense of a mental health brand because i see what we were talking in those days now is becoming more and more important and relevant because mental health is going to be uh, one of the areas where is going to be a biggest crisis now and there is definite shortage in term of whether it's a counselor whether it's a clinical psychologist whether it is a psychiatrist whether it is an content that can empower you know people are not even aware of what the mental health problem so i did worked in their area elder space also i have worked in i worked with children too you know it was an interesting that was a foundation actually which was promoting peace and non violence so the challenge was the kids who are exposed to these gamings the parents complaints are they are becoming more and more aggressive and violent so it was a challenge so um, i did and this interesting talk in a sense that we made call to 10000 people and asked the simple straight question uh that uh, who is their hero so everybody picked the bollywood or a hollywood example or or a digital example nobody picked the example of uh, mahatma gandhi let's say but they were all knowing about mahatma gandhi so so when we asked do you think mahatma gandhi was brave or a coward so they most of them said he was a brave but then we said that he didn't had a six pack you know so he was he was a strong or courageous or not so they all said yes he was a strong and courageous and that's how the non violence um, project came into existence the peace project uh that's one of again which i feel there is a large scale work is required across globe with digital can make it possible um peace and non violence is not a part of curriculum which is not part of our daily life it is not part in our school classroom it is it is not there so when i see lot of violence across the globe or when i see lot of conflicts around the globe i think that is one of the reason where digital can possibly provide solution that have a piece as a or a value as a part of your curriculum or growing up so now completely i think this is a uh, one of the things that i think uh, like you just mentioned is going to be more increasingly important for everything we do so one question i have for you on this level is so when it comes to um, to the work we did with the Poder Foundation and mental health which is an area that like you said is going to be increasing more important can you tell us a bit more about that work and as well some concrete things because of course i think everyone right now is is having more and more i would say more and more um i think attention especially with covid-19 this brought a lot of attention to this but at the same time there's still a lot of uh, i would say prejudice and the afraid a fear of facing these problems and i think uh, um as we get more technological there will be a lot of other problems that will be as well coming out of this i would like just to hear a bit of your overview on that so i i can tell you uh, uh, more on this because i interacted with a lot of elder people which are about 60 i interacted at least with 40 to 45000 people who face a different kind of a mental health challenge the capital city of the country india where i am sitting 33% elders are considered to be in a state which are called depression uh, uh, learning from whatever the podar foundation or my work on aging or even interactions with the people large number of people i personally feel mental health uh, is a very 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 simple people don't invest time from the childhood till the elder age people don't invest time in making relationships they are making relationship with gadgets with 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 all that is that is not a part of a, what you call a human interactions that 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 becomes a reality of a life for them 
the elders have not spent the time because they migrated from a rural area to urban area. We do a very typical exercise with some of the elders or some of the young people. I tell them, please pick up a phone. And they pick up a phone and I tell them, you know, imagine you are retired. Now, please remove all the numbers which are there in your phone, which will be irrelevant after your retirement. And we realize some people have 3,000 phone number. They are left with about 25 numbers at the end of the day. So in a one line, simple line, uh, be honest, share your problem, interact with people, spare some time, discuss your fear is in first step to counter mental health issue. We all want to look normal and good. Human beings are not born to look normal and good all the time in all the situation. Sometimes you want to cry. Sometimes you are weak. Sometimes you are insolvent. Uh, what a T.S. Eliot said, don't get up in the morning. You make a face in order to meet the faces. Very inspiring. And, um, and I think it's really a big thing that we need to consider going forward as we get more into the, this kind of realms. I think what you touch about the importance of connections that is not just without devices, because we are really making a very, very, very big focus on the devices and not on the human side. So I really appreciate these words and actually I take it very serious because we need really to, to work more on this. Um, Okay, so, so right now I'd like to touch a bit of the work you've been doing in terms of uh, the different parts of your more entrepreneurial side. Um, so you have multiple projects that you've been doing. So if you want to highlight the ones that you're more active, and uh, I think it's difficult sometimes to look at them because you have a lot of things. And I share two, that with you, but just a, a bit of an overview about, about you on that level. Two yeah. things is which one I have not spoken publicly still is that I'm doing something with the way the cricket is in India. I am coming out with an interesting content which is related to the sports. The cricket is a religion. Cricket is growing. Cricket is going to be in the USA as well. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are cricketer, actually is a former captain and otherwise also. Uh, so I'm doing something in a cricket which is, which is not what mainline cricket does with it. Uh, why am I doing in a cricket? Um, I feel the fear of a corona or a death. I want to bring, let's play. Let's bring the game on. Let's go back and play. And, you know, it will be valid throughout life. Sometimes you play uh, sports. Sometimes you play with words. Sometimes you play with hot object. Don't stop playing. Is, is, so we are creating some interesting content on that. That's the one part of it. And uh, we recently started Content Generation, which we wish to do for OTT. And OTT is going to, it's a $3.5 billion industry right now in the country. They are saying in three years time, it is likely to touch about $16 billion. There is a crisis of a content across the globe, I feel, when it comes to story, scripts, ideas, and a thought. And we are pretty strong in that. So we got into that area as well. These are two things that I would like to talk right now. Yeah, so let's talk about the, the content. And I want to put an additional layer there. Um, so I think on this work that you've been doing. So as a writer and me as a writer as well. So definitely there's, there's first of all, the writing, conventional writing. And the, the writing right now for social networks for for yes. for even for media for interactive media for metaverse and and of course everything related right now with artificial intelligence so how do you see this new iteration of writing that we have in the web the so-called web 3.0 that you're going to be having incredibly getting bigger that is something you know you have to understand from indian point of view so recently let's say i give you an example there's a lady who did a very interesting interview with 100 people. 100 people, she asked, do you know NFT? So 99% said no. She asked, do you know Web3, words and metaverse? They said no. That's the current state of knowledge in the country. As far as uh, metaverse or Web3 goes, I 
personally feel uh, it's a huge opportunity first time. Let's say for a creator to get away from a bigger label, bigger corporation monopolies, have their own identity, work together, create together locally relevant content, which is, uh, you know, uh, a globally still valid, I feel. I see it in that way rather than seeing it in any other way. It is it is going to democratize and make it more, it's like a pyramid, what I call, its base is going to be far more wider, which is what is the most exciting part of it, I feel. No, completely. I, I think it's, it's going to be um, probably the, the most important thing actually for this new stage of Society 5.0. So I want to touch, coming back to content, because I think people listening to us, I think there's a lot of discrepancies about what is writing content in the digital age. And uh, like you said, most of the people don't know what is metaverse, they don't know what is NFTs. Um, and most of the people don't even use, still have problems finding internet access with good quality, let's put it that way. Um, so, so I think, for instance, even having just a smart uh, smartphone, not everyone has a smartphone. Uh, for instance, I was in Sri Lanka just a couple of days ago, and uh, some people that I was in the streets, they had like a, a small uh, a small phone and they would say, okay, do you have WhatsApp? And in fact, they didn't, um, which is kind of a very basic stuff, but it's kind of key because most of the people use two, three different apps. And this is quite a big thing. So how do you see this kind of, especially the content in the digital age, but as well, the importance of writing. And you touch, for instance, the, the idea of, creating relationships, not just with the machines, which we're doing. Most of our time right now is five, six hours with digital devices. We might be doing multiple tasks, but in fact, we're spending more time with our devices than actually probably with our families and relatives. So I would like to see how do you see the, the creation, first of all, the creation of content and the interaction with content as well, because I know that it's one of your areas of expertise and passion. I see, Let's let me give you an example. Let's say there are a lot of e-commerce companies and products and services which has come in a children's space in India. But if you talk about content being produced for children in the last two decades in the country, it's dramatically very less. Okay, I'm just giving you an example. Um, the demand for the content is going to be extremely huge, including video or a writing. It's also challenging that there are less number of writers these days who can churn out mature content. So I see that this is this is a lot which is going to happen because in last two weeks I am seeing almost three big international companies uh, announcing, let's say, they will be going in OTT and content and everybody knows the content is going to be the main area. So there is huge amount of investment which is happening. But, but if you don't come from a reading, writing background, I personally feel it will be very challenging for you to run an entrepreneurial organization which is, which is into a content-centric business. A content-centric company which is primarily producing content for different mindset and for different age. So you're not producing content for financial literacy, let's say. If you are you have to produce a content for a children's bedtime story, because these stories will change because their life has changed. The, the stories which were relevant in the past is no longer relevant. I have a, I have a you know, my wife's niece is about seven year who is a, she's a writer in her writing i can see that the reference is not india anymore she has sent some she's published already at the age of eight her references are castle of uk because her television exposes her to different kind of a world her memories and fantasies are changing so i i see their content is going to be an extremely exciting area. And I think that's why it's getting more and more expensive in sense of uh, earlier writer used to get paid very less. They are getting huge amount of money now for writing content. I'm not talking of digital content, which comes in form of articles. I'm talking of hardcore literary content, which is used for 
various kinds of things, whether OTT, television, short video capsules, YouTube, etc. Or a podcast, let's say. Yeah, I think this is going, you touch uh, one of the most important things uh, when it comes to content. So I, I, we are, I'm cautious that we don't have a lot of more time, at least for the first stage, but I think this will be the first of a lot of interviews. Um, okay. So, so one, one of the last things I would like to ask uh, uh, as a wrap up. So from the present tasks and the various different things that you do, I know that you recently have been working as well in well-being platforms besides just the mental health and you have a kind of ventures on that. Can you tell us a bit about this work? Uh, and that wellness is what yeah so wellness is like you know how it it came into an existence i tell you very interesting if you go back to 2019 december our first news which hardcore researcher was knowing who was who's like a terminator of a google was knowing that there is some news of some strange death happening in china but it was very less in december 2019 by the January end in this country by March, but otherwise between January to March, everybody was knowing about this COVID. What I have realized in two years of time, people don't want to die. I think nobody wants to die ever. Okay, that's, that's the truth. But people now don't want to be sick also that is the one worry which has been added that worry was there but they don't want to be sick or i will relate it to in indian rupees there are about 619 million people they are saying in last two years we just started spending 4000 rupees which is every month on a wellness you know 4000 rupees would be approximately let's say a one dollar is about 60 rupees it's approximately let's say 400 300 dollar per month this all people these are new generation people wellness is more prevalent amongst 19 to 35 year old people so like if i type in a google I want to remain healthy. What is the answer that Google gives it to me? I did this for myself. How to remain healthy? It gives me thousand options. I cannot say which one is relevant. First option it gives me is of the companies which has put some money to pop up their ads and the Google advertising. So, I gone back to the ancient text in tribal history and Ayurveda and I picked up certain things where there are no controversies and I'm trying to generate a content which this health companies can use to empower their customer so they should know what is useful if if you're taking something in your mouth uh, you have to understand one thing with this However you exercise, however much you run, whatever that you eat, even if you take care of your mental health, if you are not happy, you will pop off. That's the key. Now, how to be happy is, is what wellness comprises of, as per me. So we are trying to create some very common sense content. It's, it's really, uh, I think, is a masterclass on that level how you do that. And I think that's probably yeah. be one of the most important <laughs> things for our civilization is how we replace part of the balance of culture, our tribal systems, our religions, with a more well-being based uh, lifestyle that is still very important. So um, I think for today, we're going to finish here because we have both time commitments. Okay. Um, but uh, well, I'm very excited probably to keep a second one to talk about more yes. about India uh, and some of the other yes. things. Um, so just as a last um, um, part, could you tell us where people can find your writings? Uh, because, of course, my audience it's, is not just India. So I have some, where people can find you, I'll put these, of I, course. As well. Actually, I, my couple of writings are on, uh, here and there in newspapers and all that. I have two published books, which I have not put it on digital. 
most of my content, you know, I have to understand when television, um, you know, in 98 until 2002, television was <coughs> shot on 360 camera. We used to have no hi-fi studios. So I've been trying to bring this as a digital repository soon. But uh, last, one more, one thing that I want to, to put in this podcast for everybody, which is, which could be inspiring for people when they have a fear of being unhealthy or something. So I just want to share a little uh, information with all of them. A Mahatma Gandhi at very young age discovered that he has a two serious problem. One, uh, he was suffering from a severe constipation for which he was under treatment for four years. And he discovered he has a high blood pressure. He took constipation medicine for four years. He did medication for about a couple of months. This was just between 29 to 30 year of age, 33 years of age. Gandhiji was shot dead at the age of 79. He was perfectly fit and healthy. He never took a medicine ever in his life. He survived with high blood pressure and constipation. The only thing that he did is that a uh, essential walk. People say he walked so much that it was as equivalent to taking a two round of this earth. He used to walk every day. So uh, being healthy and happy doesn't cost a lot of money. It doesn't cost you a very great gym. It's just a simple conviction, I suppose. Now, very important. I think actually for me is one of my favorite uh, exercises. And uh, I think it's, we all need that. So, Kewal, I think we'll put the links to where people can find your books and some of your social media yes. interacting as yes. well for your I podcast. Will. And, um, and I want to thank you for this time and for these wonderful insights and inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.